They are all uh, welcome to the web webinar on elevating partnership, the aspiration of Saudi Arabia airport PPP market. Well, uh, for those that do not know me yet, my name is Jacques Follin. I am member of the steering committee and chairman of the airport chapter of QAP, the World Association of PPP Units and PPP Professionals. Just allow me to share some webinar technicalities and present to you the sequence of the events during the following 90 minutes. The webinar uh, you'll be attending is being recorded and is scheduled to finish around 11.30 CT Geneva time. So, so which means 12.30 Saudi Arabia time and around 10.30 in London time. We will make the recording available on the web YouTube channel just after the, the webinar. <clears throat> the chat function is activated, but just for organizational matters, so please don't use it, but use the Q&A box for any question you may have, and this question will be uh, answered at the end of the, the round table. The, 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 the event will be very simple. We'll make a, a quick uh, introduction, then a presentation of the um, deal pipeline in uh, airport PPP in Saudi Arabia, and then we will moderate the round table. Just uh, <coughs> before starting, I would like to make a, a very quick introduction of, on Saudi Arabia and its airport development. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's a great time for Saudi Arabia in terms of airport development, because the, the kingdom is today on a strategic uh, trajectory toward comprehensive infrastructure transformation in alignment with the project Vision 2030. Airports are a pivotal component of this program, as the nation envisages a substantial increase in passenger capacity, aiming to serve 300 million passengers by 2030, I guess the figures are correct, um, and which is a significant jump from the baseline traffic of today, which is approximately 100 million passengers. It was the figure in 2019, and I understood that uh, <coughs> the figures today are above 2019. To achieve some ambitious development program, the kingdom envisages to invite the private sector to collaborate with its public sector. It's been done before a lot of time, <clears throat> but it's very interesting to understand from this experience, what are the lessons learned from the private, uh, <clears throat> for the public private partnership, uh, which have been passed or still existing. How will PPP contribute to the future growth of Saudi airports? What will be the structure of future PPPs and other questions? This webinar may be not answered to all the questions, but will, it will aim at answering most of them with a brilliant uh, panel of experts uh, coming from government entities, operators, investors, and advisors. So this webinar will be moderated, will be co-moderated by myself and Dr. Nadine Itani. Uh, Nadine, you may, you, may, you may see her. I mean, Nadine is a program leader for air transport management at the University of Surrey in the United Kingdom. She is a purpose-driven aviation academic and has contributed to managing ICAO development project in the Middle East. For the, 50, the, I'm sorry, for the past 15 years, she has been supporting government agencies, airlines and airports in the MENA regions in business strategy and organizational development, including recently in Saudi Arabia. But Nadine, before giving you the floor and introduce our brilliant panelist team, let me ask Alex Vidal, an expert from our partner Modalis, to make a brief description of the airport PPP deal pipeline in Saudi Arabia. So I have to do some technicalities and, and share my screen, which is where it is. That's it. And, and to go and this morning. So Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, uh, and Nadine for inviting Modalis to take part of, of this webinar. Uh, we've been partners with WAP for more than three years now, and we are very proud of continuing this collaboration. So what's explained by and introduced by Jack, my contribution is to provide you with a brief description of the past, current, and the possible pipeline 
of airport deals in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, let me uh, allow me to introduce you very quickly and in a few words, uh, who is Modalis. We are a strategic and technical advisory firm specialized in airports. Um, we deliver expertise in addressing industry challenges with real world experience and a holistic view of airport investment and development. So we are organized through uh, five business units. Um, through our business unit, our IR, investment resource, which is specifically tailored to private sector and, and transactions. We actively track investments globally in both the primary and the secondary market. So maybe you can go to the next slide, Jack, please. That's what I'm doing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm... Okay, that's it. Sorry. Okay, thank you. So we have observed different forms and models of private sector participation in, in airports and estimate that uh, globally half the most world airport uh, passenger traffic is handled in airports where, uh, where the private sector uh, is, is participating. Um, we have also observed huge differences uh, within the different continents with Europe uh, and Latin America, they should capture this, uh, this uh, well, with passengers transiting in, in, in airports um, strongly participated by the private sector. Uh, next, please. Uh, so when it relates to Saudi Arabia, uh, and especially to, to the existing and close transactions, um, so we have seen management contracts uh, for the three top airports, uh, Jeddah, Riyadh, and Damam, and out of two are still ongoing, which is Jeddah and Riyadh. Um, concession model has been also implemented in Saudi Arabia for the Hajj terminal in Jeddah and Medina Airport. And it's worth to mention uh, as well that one uh, out of five existing closed transactions is for a Winfield Airport, the Red Sea International Airport. You can go to the next slide. Actually, yeah, thank you. So according to the publicly available information we are handling, some upcoming transactions are expected in Saudi Arabia. Uh, four regional airports are at the very, uh, at the very early stage of the presentation process. Uh, these airports are Aba, Taif, Gassim, and Haim. And we have also heard some intentions of PPP for the three top airports plus the book airport. In Jeddah, most likely this will learn after the construction works are, are, are ended. So thank you very much for your time. I will let the floor to my colleagues. Well, thank you very much, um, Alex, for this uh, presentation. I, I hope that our, our friends from Saudi Arabia, our advisors and, and, and other speakers uh, will uh, give us more information on this project and the way they will be, they will be handled. So now after this presentation, uh, which shows the importance of PPP in, in Saudi Arabia uh, airport industry. He, I would like to um, give the floor to Nadi and Itani he, to introduce um, our uh, brilliant panel of panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jack. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm so pleased that I'm here today with you moderating this uh, discussion. Um, and thank you uh, to Alex as well for setting the stage to start uh, the discussions on uh, on a very solid uh, note. Um, I will ask the uh, panelists, please, to briefly introduce uh, themselves so we could uh, kick off uh, afterwards. So as they appear on my screen, I'll start with uh, Abdul Aziz. Go ahead, Abdul Aziz. Uh, good morning. Um... Uh, my name is Abdiz al I, uh, I oversee the privatization enablement as part of the regulator's mandate. Uh, 
And I would like to welcome today my esteemed uh, co-panelists and uh, attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Lee Lawrence, go ahead. Hello there, I'm Lee. Uh, I'm Vice President for New Business Development here at Vision Invest. Uh, I've been in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia now for over eight years and in the Middle East for 16 years. And for most of that time, been involved in PPP and infrastructure development, uh, uh, mostly within the airport sector. Thank you. Again, as uh, per the appearance on the screen, uh, Abdul Ilah, you're next. Hi, uh, Salam Alaikum. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Abdulillah. Uh, I'm uh, senior director within NCP. I oversee the transport sector within CP. I've been working in PPP and project finance for over 10 years right now. And uh, I welcome everyone uh, and my fellow colleagues, the panelists as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Antoine, you're next. Yes, thank you, Nadine. Uh, Antoine Cousin, I'm a partner at White in Case, uh, legal advisor. I've also been based in the region for a long time, uh, 13 years, including six in Riyadh. And I focus on uh, infrastructure and energy projects. And I've been fortunate enough to be involved in multiple airport concessions in the region, including in Saudi Arabia, ranging from the Medina project and then its restructuring uh, to the Hatch project, to the Taif project, et cetera. And uh, very happy to um, be here today. Thank you. Jacques, you're next. Yes, wow. hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Jacques. You have two Jacks here. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so my name is Jacques Oriati. I'm the Chief Commercial uh, Officer of Aegis in the Middle East and South Asia. Uh, obviously, uh, Aegis is very active on the aviation scene in Saudi Arabia currently. We have more than 1,000 people on the ground uh, working with different infrastructure projects, and of course, aviation is one of them. Um, we are uh, looking forward to participate in the next airport operations, or oh, hopefully uh, NPPP uh, scheme of Saudi Arabia. Currently, we're operating 18 airports around the world, and uh, I look forward to discussing with the fellow panelists uh, the different topics that we've envisaged to discuss with you guys. Thank you so much, uh, Jack. And last but not least, Dorian. Good uh, good day, everyone, uh, Hi. wherever you are. Um, my name is Dorian Reese. I'm a partner at Del Um It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I've had about 20 years of experience in airports and airport transactions, both in UK, Europe, and now the Middle East. So it's a pleasure to be with you all. Sort of Thank you, Dorian. I think you are... A riveting yeah. conversation with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, your internet is not that stable, but Torian is uh, is here with us and he's representing Deloitte. So uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, gentlemen, for introducing yourself. So ladies and gentlemen, for the next uh, uh, 60 minutes, an hour, we're going to embark in this discussion about the airport's PPP market in Saudi Arabia. I'd like to start uh, with uh, Abdul Ilah and the topic about governance and distribution of roles. So uh, Abdul Ilah and maybe afterwards Abdul Aziz could uh, pick up on this as well. So in light with the recent reorganization of institutions in PPP market and the wider airport context, so would you please elaborate more on this collaborative framework between NCP, GACA, Matarat, and the distribution of roles and responsibilities? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, flowing from Vision 2030's uh, drive to focus on government uh, to on regulations and leveraging the private sector to deliver world class infrastructure and sectors. I think NCP, you know, was established as a center for you know for excellence to oversee that participation from the private sector, uh, and and we have successfully you know uh, completed and established the Peace Be Law uh, two, more than two years ago, which is uh, which is providing a very clear and transparent framework to execute privatization and PPP projects, uh, with all the focus of protecting investors' rights as well. Uh, I think in addition to that, NCP provides uh, legal and commercial advice support to government procurers uh, with its team of local and international experts as well. Uh, we, we have uh, within NCP a dedicated team to promote investment both locally and internationally, uh, as well as provide specialized PPP 
uh, and, and privatization training to government and private uh, stake, uh, stakeholders as well. Airports within the transportation and, and logistics sectors are one of the uh, 16 sectors that, PCP, that, the, that the NCP looks after and, and, and thrives toward, toward you know, sp spanning the economic and social infrastructure for the kingdom. Uh, I think the, 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 the kind of changes marked from Vision 2030 is to have a segregation between the regulation and the ownership. I think today GACA is the, reg is a, is the regulator for the aviation sector and setting up uh, economic regulation, safety standard and quality standards to all airports. Madarat today, you know, uh, is a holding company that owns the pro that, that owns the airports currently. And I think in the kingdom, uh, you know, there are almost all airports are, you know, uh, are owned and run by uh, run by uh, the the government state. However, there have been a number of successful privatizations. Uh, and PPP contracts, for example, as as uh, Andrew mentioned early on, uh, Hajj Terminal back in two thousand seven, uh, and uh, as well Medina uh, Airport uh, that was done in two thousand eleven as well. Uh, however, the push now is to deliver the new greenfield and brownfield airports as well through the private pri pri private public uh, public private partnership as well, and uh, currently currently including. Uh, I think main four airports. That's the next uh, up and coming, which is Abha, Daif, Qasim, and Hayal. Other will also flow, but this will uh, this all result. Uh, this will all come will come into phases as well in the future. Uh, all of this is kind of coming from the again from the Vision 2030 and Tourism and Aviation National uh, Strategies as well, uh, which has already seen a significant growth in, in the kingdom of all, all of these points. Uh, and I think, you know, to conclude in, from this perspective, uh, you know, airports, PVP are, you know, are being kind of tendered today uh, or will be tendered uh, soon uh, through Matarat as the as the owner uh, with the engagement and support of NCP GACA and, uh, and the Ministry of Finance. And this will be under and, and this will be uh, and this will be under PSP law. Yeah, thank you so much, Abdelilah. Abdelaziz, would you please walk us through um, the institutional setup in terms of the institutions that will lead the initiating airport PPP projects, tendering processes, who will manage them, providing a regulatory oversight? Of course, it's it's Heka, but I mean, tell us more about this uh, collaboration or the integration between the responsibilities and roles. So uh, as my uh, colleague Adila mentioned, we are collaborating together as Madarat as the ownership, because as part of the uh, privatization, we have moved the assets outside of the regulator so that GACA would have its own separate role of over uh, of providing over uh, overarching regulations, ensuring safety standards and uh, proper competition. While uh, NCP has the sole role of um, uh, making sure that the tender or the process as a whole goes within the PSP law and in compliance with that. While Matarat is potentially the grantor and the holding company that ultimately owns the asset that will be concessions, for example, the four airports we're planning to launch. Thank you. Thank you. Um, speaking of uh, Vision 2030, since uh, Abdulillah, you've mentioned it, I want to continue this uh, as a concept with you. Um, and if you could elaborate and discuss more on the strategic priorities when it comes specifically to uh, airport development projects uh, under the Vision, and uh, whether there is a more, uh, an inclination to include more uh, airports current and future airports uh, under PPP schemes? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think perhaps uh, I know we'll leave some space to my colleague Adelaziz to answer this in, in, into further details, but I will touch upon kind of a general idea. Uh, what's the purpose of, of, of trying to do kind of projects, uh, you know, in the kingdom or on, under PPP? 
as well. I think the main key drivers for this is to improve the quality and efficiency of or efficiencies of the airports, and of course to optimize the participation of the private sector. This kind of this will happen through uh, an increase in competition uh, within the sector, and and of course to have a you know to have to aim to have a sustainable, a financially sustainable airport industry with diversity in, from sets of different operators are, are kind of one of one of the goals. And I think the main kind of message if I had to kind of outline it here is that we simply cannot achieve our goals and our ambitions as a nation without the support of the private sector and i think that's that's heavily relies you know on the vision 2030 where where one of its principles and one of its uh, main pillars is to enable that thank you uh abdul aziz would you like to pick on this uh, yeah, so basically today under the vision we have, uh, and, and the end of 2020, we, we got the National Aviation Sector Strategy approved. Uh, our role at GAC is to lead and coordinate the implementation of that strategy, which, um, which has ambitious goals to achieve 330 million passengers by 2030, connecting uh, KSA to 250 destinations directly. Of course, this will require massive investment that could reach to $100 billion between now and 2030. And the private sector, as I mentioned, is a huge contributor to achieve such goals and to make sure that we have a sustainable and efficient airport system that will accommodate and will help achieve and implement uh, the strategy. Thank you, Abdelaziz. Uh, Dorian, um, as government advisor, uh, would you please tell us more about how is Deloitte contributing to this transformation, a transformative vision of the kingdom, stressing on your role in the airport stream? Can I you mean, tell us, Dorian? Dorian? I think Dorian has difficulties to, to connect. Maybe we could ask our, 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 our friends from NCP and GACA to tell us more about the, the coming project, if they have, have some idea on the timing, on the project that are uh, popping up now, and what are the, uh, the, the next priorities in terms of project. I would like to take this one. Abdelaziz. OK, so today we have four airports in our pipeline. Uh, what's, what, what, what we have learned and uh, as we study these airports, that e each airport will have its unique uh, characteristics. You have Abha as a touristic destination, and you have Taif as a Hajj and Umrah destination, and you have Qasim as some, some sort of a hybrid domestic international connectivity, and you have Hail as a, a domestic uh, airport. Uh, we understand that today we are doing uh, the, the required studies that will make sure that we go to market when these airports are ready and we have sufficient uh, data that the, the private sector can actually rely on in, in submitting their bids. We expect, uh, we, are, we, are, we have reached advanced levels in these studies on both Abha and Taif. And we think those the airports will go um, any sooner than Qasim and Hail. However, what, what we need to comfort the private sector about is that we will not go to market unless we have the proper studies and the proper, uh, let's say, a checklist. All all boxes are checked. That we are we are uh, we have a solid uh, PVP that will not differentiate from the success stories we have in Medina and Hajj. Yeah, but and, and if I want to add as well to Abdelaziz's uh, point as well, I think we need to consider, you know, uh, on uh, in in the vast size of the land mass in the in, in the kingdom. I think today, uh, traditionally, you know, uh, it's been seen as 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 you know, uh, from that perspective of of, of aviation, is that the Mams in the east, where we are in the center, and uh, and Jeddah is in, in the west. However, today there's a group, much much greater focus on other areas uh, in the kingdom, and of course, you know, including Neom in the north, and of course, Abha in the south, as Abdelaziz have mentioned, there's a lot of focus on the tourism. There are as well, you know, up, you know, uh, focus on diversifying the the region regions and uh, their needs within the kingdom. I think the approach, you know, the approach for PVPs in general is tailored for each for each airport. I think historically, majority of these kind of uh, kind of focus and reliance was on corporatization, management contracts. 
uh, and ONMs. I think now now we are moving towards a full concession. Uh, and and that's kind of I'm trying to establish as well a high profitable you know airport, uh, you know uh, through these concessions uh, you know when when they are passed on the full demand to the private sector, you know some airports will have their own challenges in terms of profitability, uh, but at the end of the day it's about the risk that are going to be transferred to the private sector, uh, and and how that how can the government alongside with the private sector in structuring that deal will will pal out. Towards the end, and as I just said, that we are we are studying these projects. You know, uh, I know perhaps the market has been hearing quite a bit about lots of things, uh, and there's a lot of market sounding as well. But uh, inshallah, we're nearly there. Inshallah, hopefully. Uh, thank you, Abdullah and Abdulaziz. Uh, I will move uh, now to uh, the uh, strong track record in implementing the PPP projects and having the investor, operator, and also from a legal perspective on the impact of crisis on this uh, PPP model. So building from this strong track record in Saudi Arabia and executing the uh, private-public partnerships in airports, and a lot of lessons, of course, has been learned. Alhamdulillah and Abdulaziz already mentioned that they, are, they wish to capitalize on Jeddah and Medina success stories. So I would like uh, perhaps to start with Lee from an investor perspective, uh, your viewpoint on how disruption uh, and the traffic meltdown during COVID-19 was dealt with. And could you please share some lessons learned um, on how would this impact uh, the de design of the PPP projects going forward? Yeah, thank you very much. And and thank you very much, uh, Abdelila and uh, Abdelaziz. I think you paint a very encouraging picture, I think, for the kingdom in how it's looking to use airports uh, and aviation as a real catalyst to support your, your long-term Vision 2030 objectives. Um, and I think there are some fantastic lessons to be learned. We've had some great successes here in the kingdom. Um, Vision Invest is a multi-sector investor. We specialize in PPPs, but we're not agnostic to any sector. Uh, we have experience across water, power, um, including transportation, logistics, social infrastructure. So right across um, KSA, our experience is that there is no sort of single one cookie, cookie cutter approach. Um, we've seen very different participation models uh, applying to projects even within the same sector. For example, 30 year concessions all the way through to five year O&M contracts and, and sort of other things in between. So I'd sort of make three points in terms of the lessons learned um, from, from our perspective, and that is the first one is a little bit obvious. Airports are all different. Um, they've got different size, different characteristics, different requirements, and different growth drivers. And they're all positioned differently to support the objectives of the nation. You know, whether it be for APA or TAIF, Highland Gas, in Jeddah, Medina, uh, they've all got a different part and a different role to play in that ecosystem. So, albeit we've seen projects in the kingdom you're procured within a certain procurement model, that doesn't necessarily mean that that will necessarily apply to the future or to the current. So I think there is an element of, you know, making sure that we go through that process of evaluation um, and that the business case assessment, you know, will ultimately lead to, to different outcomes. The second point I'd make is about engagement. Um, and if there's one thing that I think we've really benefited from as investors, and that is that structured, organized engagement process that NCP and the procurer, um, Matarat and Gaka, have done to test the market, both with bidders, both with banks, potential operators, to try and really test the appetite for structures. Um, just because projects have worked in different markets with a, within a certain par parameter doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to work here. And of course, this current environment is different. So the third point I'd make is that these projects do take time. Um, we've talked about the investment in the upfront sort of market assessment, um, but we recognize that development projects are complex. Uh, there are many stakeholders involved through that development journey, and the capacity of those partners and parties is now coming under some strain. Um, there's lots of projects within going on in the kingdom. Um, some of these are some of the world's largest, um, and we're in a slightly competitive landscape. And to get these projects into the market, we need to make sure that you know they create the right attention. 
Thank you, Lee. So there's no one size fits all and it's complex projects plus the lessons learned might not be generalized, right? So each uh, project or each uh, airport has its own uh, story to tell. Uh, uh, Jacques, uh, what do you think about, uh, about this perspective that uh, Lee shared? Do you share a similar perspective from a um, standpoint of an operator? Yes, I, I totally agree with, uh, with with Lee, and there's no one size that fits all, uh, Nadine. And uh, the proof is that out of the 18 airports that we operate, uh, each one is in a different uh, physical location uh, around the world, and each one has its own, I would say, uh, particularities. So we really need to take into consideration every airport uh, and study each case really in depth, and really the, the, the upfront work that is being currently done by uh, NCP, GACA, and Matarat is key uh, because this will be the starting point for us to launch our process once we are looking at any file, uh, whether it's the first four airports or others. I think just to um, continue on, build up on what Lee is saying, uh, I think there's a main risk uh, for Saudi Arabia today. It's the CapEx risk because uh, we, we currently have, uh, of course, a lot of construction work happening in Saudi Arabia. All the contractors are really uh, overloaded uh, with projects. Uh, so whenever we're pricing uh, any uh, construction cost, um, we will find, I think, a bit more difficulties to find contractors that would commit, commit on their capex. And this, uh, from an operator perspective, uh, will put us in a bit of a uh, difficulty while we're building our business plan uh, for the airport. Uh, so I think we really need to engage with contractors as soon as possible uh, and as early as possible to make sure that they're committed, if possible, for them to take some equity to to to, to split the risk with, with us operators and investors uh, and yeah this is the this is i think a, a main point that we need that we need to add however in contrary to that uh, we, uh, we we are more confident on the level of traffic that the saudi airports are uh, are uh, that will witness uh, we know that the Ministry of Tourism, Ministry of Culture, and all of the development companies that are happening in Saudi Arabia from north to south, east to west, uh, have very, I would say, ambitious plans to attract more people to Saudi Arabia. So from an airport operator perspective, we would like to work hand in hand with them if we are operating one of the airports in order to boost the traffic as much as possible. But having this engagement coming, coming from the government entities is really key uh, to, the, to boosting the traffic and, and, and all of the airports of Saudi Arabia. Thank you so much, uh, Jack. And now from a legal perspective, uh, Antoine, how the crisis impacted the contractual setup that was in place and where the contractual frameworks that, that were already designed, do they anticipate such unprecedented events and the subsequent shocks that might come in the future? Well, thank you. Uh, we really got to test some of those contracts that we had drafted so five years and 10 years earlier, which was interesting. Um, the first, you know, you would look at two different concession agreements and you would reach completely different, sometimes opposite conclusions in terms of, you know, which party is supposed to absorb the risk of COVID-19. And it's not, not just COVID-19, it's, you know, in the future, it could be any, any sort of fundamental event affecting uh, a 20 year uh, concession project. And those events happen, you know, COVID-19, was hopefully a one-off occurrence, but uh, radical changes in circumstances happen in the context of 20-year projects. So you would look at one contract and that contract would allocate that risk entirely to the concessionaire and another contract would allocate that contract to the grantor or the governmental authorities. And some of the contracts were unclear. Um, so it really changes the dynamic, you know, the negotiation dynamic or the restructuring dynamic, depending on whether the contract says that something is your problem rather than the other party's problem. Um, so even if you don't go to court, even if you don't arbitrate, if you don't even if you don't terminate, it really impacts the uh, the commercial dynamic, depending on you know what the, depending on what the contract says and whether it's in your favor or not in your favor. Now that being said, going back to your question. Those contracts are have even the best uh, the best concession contract in the world will have a very robust 
force measure regime, a very robust rebalancing mechanism so, so that you can you know, rebase the concession, whether it's revising the uh, revenue share, uh, the profit share, uh, and other aspects of the contract, you know, the economics of the contract. But those mechanisms are meant to work in the context of relatively short events, you know, up to, say, six months, maximum 12 months, which is when sort of insurance money runs out, basically. Uh, no me mechanism can really be hardwired into a contract to preempt a global crisis spanning two years. Uh, that cannot happen. So at some point, people cannot just rely on the terms of their contract. They have to sit down together with a view to restructuring the whole project. Um, now, and also we've looked at, you know, we've seen contracts where one of the parties had, or sometimes both parties had the right to terminate. But of course, people don't want to terminate necessarily, um, whether because, you know, the concessionaire doesn't want to terminate because of the way the termination payments were structured, the way they were negotiated. That people realize that they would forfeit future profits, for example, to a large extent, and that terminating and walking away from the deal would be very onerous. Uh, the grantor, if the grantor has the right to terminate, they realize that, well, yes, I have that right, but obviously I don't want to exercise it because it would be extremely disruptive. So in, in practice, what happens and what we've seen and we're involved in uh, in, in numerous uh, you know, instances uh, were global restructuring of those projects. And what we've seen uh, the most of was a combination of, um, you know, a temporary waiver of the concession fees uh, until the traffic sort of goes back to normal, uh, potentially an extension of the term to make up for, uh, you know, to, to sort of neutralize the impact of that restructuring on the grantor, for example, from a revenue perspective, a rebalancing of the revenue sharing, et cetera. And of course, when you have complex long-term concessions, it's not just about the grantor and the concessionaire, it's also about the lenders. Uh, but I think that what we've seen is that most, um, the, 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 the projects that we've seen were able to be restructured uh, successfully. And that was, it was very nice to be uh, part of that process. Thank you so much, um, Antoine. So, um, Abdelaziz, if I, may, if I may go uh, with this question to you about we're still in the uh, area of mitigating risk on traffic uh, demand. So, um, in terms of uh, the risks, of course, they are coming in different shapes and forms, geopolitics, uh, environment restrictions and constraints maybe in the future, and also health crisis, to name a few. And given the fact that the airport projects span over a longer period a period of time, so we could really not anticipate the uh, the impact of uh, this risk. From a government perspective and the regulator's point of view, uh, how is Saudi government planning to instill a sufficient level of confidence in future traffic projections in order to facilitate the financing of the PPP projects in airports? So um, as Antoine said, um, we have um, solid lessons learned that taught us what, what to do in our future PPPs and how to make sure that we have the necessary regulatory framework that will enable both PPPs, privatization, or the commercialization of airport efforts. So, for example, one key uh, element that we, we developed, which is the department that I'm overseeing today, it's the privatization enablement department. So this is a department that is under GACA that is with the sole focus of enabling the privatization, ensuring that private sector's risk is fully mitigated. And we have undertaken key necessary uh, steps to try and regulate the, the, the relationship between the regulator and the, the concessioner or the investor in a way that if an unforeseeable, unforeseeable event happens, such as COVID-19, the investor is always protected and his obligations are related to how wide, how, how, how feasible the project is. A good example was, for example, in Medina, when, when COVID-19 happened, the direction from the center of the government came to us, GACA, at that time we were the grantor, told us protect the investor. That's your number one priority. Because your, this investor came, invested, and made it one of the leading airports in the country. So what we did is we spoke to the investor. We made sure that they, they don't have any obligations that might cause them any uh, unnecessary issues, both from their fiscal part and technical part. And I think we've done a great job in trying to set the precedent for the PPPs that when something 
like this happens, we have the necessary mechanisms and regulations that will ensure that nothing will affect the investor uh, at the end. Thank you, um, Abdulaziz. Uh, Abdulillah, would you like to uh, take this one as well and bring in your perspective? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I mean, from the, the, the multiple perceptions on this, I think I want to wanna thank uh, uh, Lee and Jack and Dwayne on, on, on their points because they were, you know, well put out from that perspective. And I think uh, there, are, there, are, there are multiple key lessons learned that the kingdom has done today and has learned. And as you said, Nadine, there's no one size fits all. Each uh, airport has its... Uh, has its own, uh, you know, uh, conditions or has its, uh, you know, uh, characteristics. Yeah. Yeah, characteristics and all and all of that kind of that point and 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 the the rationale where where the where NCP mainly in terms of the structuring alongside with the procurer and with the regulator for this instance Gasca as well, is that to bring in the right incentives and to build that in, in in and make it clear of requirements in terms of what the private sector needs to be doing and all that stuff. Risks, we always try as NCP transfer the risk as much as we can to the private sector, but of course not ex you know not kind of excessive in a way that's still loop, still kind of interesting to the private sector and still bank for as well from that perspective. And I think, if, you know, and I think if I want to touch upon the COVID situation, which, which are, you know, as well said through my fellow colleagues as well from, from, from multiple experiences. And I think I just want to shed some light into what has happened in, you know, in, you know, in Saudi for specifically Medina Airport. I think uh, GACA and CP jointly have done an extraordinary work into solving that point and, and, and getting into that level of details to have a win-win situation. And again, NCP kind of doesn't look into just only the government perspective, and that's where it comes in handy to provide that from, from, from that perspective in, in that kind of point. And I think if in terms of, in terms of you know, uh, uh, the structuring and having looking at into different structures, there are multiple ways, and, and it always depends on, on, on the, on the on the requirements from the government perspective sometimes governments are ambitious in terms of their forecast or they need to build certain certain requirements for alter, for other reasons and then the traffic will come in and sometimes no the traffic is already there and we want to kind of build up and and bulk up these kind of airports to fit in that demand from that perspective as well yeah. thank you so much yes of if course. i may of course, if yeah. i may i just like to add to give an example of uh, how this government and uh, so public-private uh, partnership works. I just like to share the example of uh, our uh, concession in, in Larnaca, uh, where we had Cyprus Airways that was the lead hub carrier uh, that went bankrupt in 2015. Uh, but then a few months later, we had, uh, sorry, a few days later, we had uh, all the government entities coming to us as airport operators, ministries and so on. And we built together a crisis cell in which we worked together to attract and cover in two months time, 80% of the traffic that Cyprus Airways was covering to our airport. And then by six months time, we had 100% of the traffic that was the gap that was created by Cyprus Airways that was uh, covered. So this is really key. And uh, we witness it a lot and it's really key. And I think Saudi authorities ha have uh, uh, showed it in the Medina example with COVID-19. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Jacques. I'm a bit mindful of time, so I will move on to Dorian uh, with the PPP models. Um, uh, Dorian, the Saudi government is contemplating different approaches for the future of uh, PPP initiatives as a government um, advisor uh, in terms of, uh, from a strategic perspective. Could you please describe the characteristics of these uh, models and frameworks that should be considered uh, strategically? I mean, Nadine, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I mean, Dorian is having trouble, I mean, connecting. I mean, we, we probably could add the question to... Uh, I, I can, uh, yeah, I, I can, yeah, I can go very yeah, uh, I'll, I'll have a go in, in Dorian's absence. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I come from the perspective that we're fortunately involved in looking at a number of big proposals <laughs> sectors. Um, so I take the perspective from the market as a whole. 
Um, I think we've got nine bid proposals this year um, with NCP and other procurers um, in Saudi Arabia. And as investors, you know, what we do is we really welcome that sort of early engagement that we talked about. Um, we know that there is a, a challenge um, ultimately to achieve, you know, what the key objectives of, um, um, of what the, the, the PPP model is about. So I think having that sort of interaction and, and what Dorian, I'm sure, would say is that he spends a lot of time talking to investors, talking to banks, talking to bidders, talking to the community about how do you get the three key elements right? And those elements being what's the best commercial model for this asset? Um, who are the parties that need to be involved and what kind of stake do they need to bring to the table? And it could be different for different projects. What's that risk allocation? Um, and how do we ensure that's a balanced allocation between the procurer's ultimate objectives and also investors and financiers? Um, and then what are the development objectives? Uh, we're talking about four different airports here with four very different characteristics. One is a greenfield project. One is an enhancement of an existing um, facility and a building a new terminal. And then two that are very uh, key uh, secondary uh, cities in the kingdom that have more of an industrial heartland, but are also growing very rapidly. So the characteristics looking at the, the nature of the demand and what drives that is key. And that takes time. Um, but what it tells us that when these projects are released, we've known they've gone through the distance. We know they're right sized and we know that the uh, procurement framework um, has been well market tested and then they'll have a very high chance of a positive outcome. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just uh, it's a question of balance. I think what Lee uh, touched is, is really critical. As long as we see as uh, international operators, investors, that there's a balance in the deal between uh, what is expected from us from a CapEx perspective and then from another side, uh, all of our obligations and our costs in terms of OPEX remunerations and so on. As long as we see that there's a, an equilibrium in the deal, of course, we will be uh, interested and we will go for it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, from my perspective, to add, I think from the structuring part, uh, you know, I think uh, within within the NCP ecosystem, is that we consider all aspects and we we look at the three parties. I think when and and to your point, Jack, as well, when you mentioned about EPC issues, we are aware of it. We're we're solving it as we speak. We're trying to have provide a lot of initiatives in the background. How can this be optimized? And this is kind of where comes the role of NCP as kind of a you know a lead in that kind of area of PPP and foreseeing any any kind of potential issues in the future because we do speak the same language as banks. Some of us are bankers, some of us are coming from the operator's side and from development side as well, collectively, collectively with the support of advisors as well. Like, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't I don't want to name kind you know certain names, but I think uh, they're you know, they, they reach out to do these kind of market sounding and reach out to certain companies and, and, and big players in the market as well. And I think I think from that perspective as well, which is which is very important to look at, is that NCP has a certain flow. And has certain gates of approvals, and and before we go to each stage to the next one, there's a certain approvals in the background that not necessarily the private sector nor banks understand this properly. You know, NCP will never be able to launch as per the law as well an RFP before the uh, green light from the Ministry of Finance, which is I think a very crucial key for these kind of success because you got the buy-in from from you know from the guarantee provider or the, the the actual funding provider uh, approval prior to go to the market and we understand sometimes these kind of potential you know uh risks from that perspective but again you know uh, the 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 you know as lee mentioned in, in, in each airport has its own characteristics and has its own kind of requirements uh there are ones that will be a full demand risk the other one's going to be so with, with with a certain support from a structural perspective and the 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 the, the, the support could be Kind of modeled in and, and structured in multiple ways, you know, either through kind of availability payments, for instance, or, or either through other forms of government support that usually that they're, that they're provided. And I think the main consideration, I think, for operators and investors, uh, you know, is 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 the quality and experience that they can bring into these transactions into these projects, financial standing, of course, and from the commercial perspective that they are able to have it 
and achieve all of these points. And I think I think these are the main items that they will be looking into. And again, uh, you know, that's that's one of the areas that NCP always kind of focus on and try to have that optimization because when that goes to market, and I think maybe Lee have have a very good experience in, in so many projects within NCP, you know, they don't see surprises when there's a market sounding and we understand the market, we understand their analysis, we understand their views, we we act accordingly. Of course, you know, we, we have a dual hat in a way, where we have to kind of consider what is right for the government and the procurer at times, uh, but as well not forgetting what the private sector can have and can do, because sometimes it has, it has to have a balance. The more risk that you transfer to the private sector, the more that that the return kind of would be required. And that's where the balance that you need to kind of play with and see at all times, there's always a value for money perspective from both parties. Thank you, Abdelilah. So structuring and financing uh, airport PPP projects is not a like a walk in the park. So it's getting more and more complex by the day. So lucky you. Uh, I will move to uh, Antoine on the same topic uh, on the striking the right balance. And uh, in your opinion, how could a successful and bankable airport PPP from a contractual and risk allocation perspective be designed? How would this work? Yeah, thank you, Nadine. That's a, an interesting question, a difficult one, because as other people have said before, there is no sort of one size fits all. Every single project is different. I think um, what makes a project bankable, i.e. able to be financed by uh, by lenders, is a combination of uh, a number of things. First, there are project-specific issues that need to be addressed in every single project uh, that may relate to the site, that may relate to environmental uh, issues, that might relate to governmental authorizations, that may relate to the you know, Ministry of Finance guarantees or other, or traffic guarantees or otherwise. Uh, that are again very you know country specific, project specific, region specific, etc. Um, and then there are sort of there are certain aspects that are on the contrary not project specific that uh, you need to have in any concession agreements in order for it to be bankable, such as and that's the key requirement really a termination payment structure that uh, uh, gives comfort to the lenders that. If the project is terminated for any reason, um, the grantor will have to make a termination payment, which is at least equivalent to the amount of the debt outstanding. I mean, that's an obvious requirement, but that's not always the case. Uh, and surprisingly, some tendering authorities, um, you know, float projects to the market that don't have those minimum sort of built-in um, uh, termination payment regimes that give comfort to the lenders. Uh, and then the risk allocation, I think, well, you always hear people saying that the risk allocation needs to be robust and balanced, in other words, fair. Uh, obviously, that means different things in different contexts. But I think the, the key requirement, as you know, people will have heard that before, but the key requirement is that each party must bear the risk that it is most, uh, you know, best equipped to bear. So uh, it's not a matter of, for a governmental authority to sort of offload as many risk as possible to the private sector. It's a matter for each party to take and agree to absorb the risk that is, is his best place to deal with. So when it comes to governmental authorizations or change in law, uh, it has to be a governmental risk. Um, when it is obviously traffic risk is, is, is complicated, it's often not entirely borne by the concessionaire, uh, but generally, it's more of a risk that is allocated to the uh, concessionaire. And then you have multiple issues, multiple risks that have to be allocated properly. Now, where we, just to wrap up on this, where we see a lot of difficulty in terms of how those constructs are actually implemented, and sometimes that results in unnecessary disputes, and sometimes even in actual litigation or arbitration, is how you go about measuring the concessionaire's performance. And that's where there's, there's a fine line. Uh, the old model is, you know, the concessionaire is responsible for generating as much traffic and as much revenue as possible, and they're responsible for that. And that's their problem. You know, how they go about doing that is their problem. So very contracts that are very light on KPIs, very light on actual OM requirements, and therefore 
uh, it's very difficult to assess whether the concessionaire is doing a good job or not. And grand tours you know, don't like that anymore. Uh, on the contrary, if the other extreme is, uh, hopefully we don't see too much of that in the region, is uh, concession agreements were, that are overly prescriptive. Uh, now, a concession is not an O&M contract. It's not a management um, services contract. Your concessionaire is not a consultant, right? You know, they're responsible for building, you know, developing, building, financing, operating, owning, and maintaining assets over a very long period of time. So they need to have enough wiggle room to do what they do best, which is operating airports. And that's why you tender that project to them in the first place, because they're competent. They know what they're doing. So there, that's and so you need basically what we've seen is the need to have simple robust, workable KPIs, performance indicators that can easily be assessed and quantified uh, and that are not overly granular. I think that's that's really fundamental. And when to, very often when you see disputes or disagreements, they arise from, from that not being the case. Thank you so much, um, Antoine. This um, uh, leads us to the last question uh, in our uh, webinar for today the elephant in the room, sustainability. So we cannot have an event talking about aviation, airports, and air airlines without addressing sustainability. Um, in terms of energy transition um, uh, goals and the uh, government standpoint, I would like to have uh, perhaps Abdelaziz's uh, point of view on how um, the kingdom is supporting the airports in the kingdom are supporting the uh, aviation sector journey uh, towards decar decarbonization and how will airports PPP schemes will be able to incorporate the environment obligations and the financial considerations as, as well as associated with uh, sustainability uh, issues. Well, uh, an alignment with Vision 2030, there's a lot of efforts when it comes to sustainability across all sectors, and there is an overarching uh, initiative, which is a uh, Green Saudi initiative. However, from our side in, in GACA, we are working with international bodies such as ICAO to develop necessary regulations and programs that will enable um, environmental sustainability across our airports or across the whole, uh, the whole ecosystem. Uh, in addition, we can see today, such as Neon Bay Airport, Red Sea Airport, they are focusing on bringing, for example, SAF, sustainable aviation fuel. However, uh, answering your, your your financial, the financial burden of this aspect, which sometimes to increase the level of investment, it's similar to what we do in the risk allocation, as uh, Antoine said. There is the balance and the enablement that is required for such um, operators and developers to comply with uh, such ma mandates. So today, uh, the part of the framework we're developing within GACA that is covering the environment sustainability is whatever we're asking for should have a response when it comes to financial sustainability of uh, being compliant to that. And I'm sure all the necessary enablement needed will be uh, tracked into, into, uh, into the regulations and to make sure that we have a sustainable ecosystem, even though we are ambitious when it comes to environmental sustainability and key initiatives are undertaken. Thank you, Abdelaziz. Uh, Jacques, from an operator perspective, would you like to uh, touch on this? I mean, since an airport has different uh, scopes of emissions and generally, I mean, scope three is the the highest in terms of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So how, how do you see this, uh, the role of airports? in sustainability sure sure as airport operators i mean uh, and as you said nadine it's it's it becomes an obligation for us to to be part of the of the sustainability story of the whole earth and of course airports and aviation in general have commitments uh, that were made and uh, just to give you some examples we just finished a um, 3.5 megawatt uh, solar uh, solar farm in larnaca airport that is benefiting in a lot of the, the airport itself next to the runway and we as well, uh, another example uh, is, for example, in, in, in Oran Airport, which is the second airport of Algeria, we installed um, a full solar panel on the terminal, and this itself generates 20% of the power that is required to, to for, for, from uh, to power the terminal itself. So I'm um, just in terms of cost, I mean, sometimes we, we, we look at it from a cost perspective, but I think 
uh, we should look at it as well from a savings perspective. First of all, financial saving, but as well, of course, saving to saving uh, for the earth. I, I think there's an ACI program as well that is really meaningful now and it's taking much more uh, importance. Uh, it's the airport carbon accreditation, and and most of our airports have went to carbon neutrality. And I think Saudi Arabia is is really pushing hard to 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 go on most of their airports. Uh, to be carbon neutral in the coming years. So we, we, we're happy to accompany them and hopefully to be part of this uh, story. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm mindful of time. I just want to uh, pick the brains of uh, Lee here on investments and sustainability. So is the market appetite more prone to uh, support like green financing and those uh, organizations that are scoring higher in terms of ESG? Uh, what's the case in Saudi Arabia? Uh, well, I mean, generically, I think you, you're absolutely correct. Um, and we're seeing all of our development projects uh, across multi-sectors all coming under greater scrutiny for energy efficiency. Um, and now whether that's lead certification or the introduction, introduction of PV, um, part of our group is very much into the production of green hydrogen. Uh, we, we will shortly be one of the largest green hydrogen producers in the world, um, supporting NEO. So we're seeing this trend um, absolutely. Airports, though, have an additional responsibility uh, to support um, an aviation market that's going through its own energy transition. So I think, as Jacques says, you know, airport carbon accreditation will become um, a, an absolute requirement, I think, in, in short order. Um, and, uh, and we see airports um, making clear commitments to be net zero within a relatively short period of time and doing that through a variety of different mechanisms. So, but, but ultimately, you know, this infrastructure comes at a cost, you know, whether it's provision for SAF or, or hydrogen for EV, you know, net zero and the charges in relation, the cost of the infrastructure to relate to net zero, we have to be careful um, because there is uh, an opportunity for these, these costs, these infrastructure costs ultimately to be passed on um, into charges that will actually impact the passenger. So this will need careful management. And I do think we need to see this as being a catalyst for the future, um, and it will become, I think, very uh, you know, a very consistent part, I think, of the development plans for airports going forward. Thank you so much, um, Lee, and thank you all. I will conclude uh, now. So in terms of OTP, perfect. We're just one minute <laughs> beyond the allocated time. Thank you so much for your uh, insights and for the constructive feedback on the topics raised. I will hand over now to uh, Jack to take on the Q&A session from the audience. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you, Nadine. Um, uh, be before starting the the uh, to answer the the the, the Q and A uh, session, I, I have a question on the uh, energy transition. I mean, you you all guys are are, are conscious of that you are all aware that uh, that uh, energy transition and carbon accreditation is, is a key issue for project. Uh, I, I would say carbon accreditation now is uh, licensed to operate. Uh, it, it's clear. I mean, we have already discussed that in in, in prior webinar uh, within WAP. I mean, the energy transition will be the challenge of the the coming years, and I'm sure that Saudi Arabia will be uh, part of this uh, of this challenge. And, and, but I have a question because you all you are all saying that that I mean, carbon accreditation and energy transition are, are, are key for airports now. But will that be a selection criteria? In the uh, in the coming uh, tenders for uh, airport PPP in Saudi Arabia, will will that be? Uh, uh, I mean, will you include include energy transition plan uh, as part of the uh, of the requested item in uh, PPP tenders? I mean, I'd like to have the answers of uh, uh, GACA and NCP on this issue. I mean, Abdullah, maybe. <laughs> You know, sure, uh, uh, on this one point, I think, uh, again, I think this is ties into the regulations and is it complied or not? The, 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 the we've, we've in, in the past with the NCP, we have actually indeed looked into kind of innovation solutions, either through the efficiencies that you've mentioned or, or alternative solutions as well. And there's always a way of, uh, of unsolicited proposals from the private sector to provide these kind of you know innovation 
in that kind of uh, span as well. And I think as a as a criteria, yes, we are looking into this. And I think especially maybe not necessarily at the airport at the, as, as, as we speak, because this is kind of something related to GAC and, and how they foresee this. And maybe the, the, the details is more with Abdelaziz. But for example, I'm just going to give another example on public transport and buses and how that would impact and all that stuff. We are looking into this and how can we make sure that there is there's kind of proper you know, efficiencies in energy and all of that stuff, and as well in power project as well in the kingdom. And I think that's the direction of the kingdom overall. But uh, for specifically in, in airports, I would maybe perhaps leave it to Abdelaziz if he has any, any kind of insight on, on the criteria and, and would that be, be a possibility? Uh, thank you. Uh, basically, today we are developing the proper regulations. However, we, we've seen some, some airports that took initiative uh, King Khalid Airport in Riyadh today has accreditation when it comes to carbon accreditation. Uh, of course, uh, part of the business development of, of such operator would be to cater to the airline's commitments. Some airlines can have commitments to sustainable aviation fuel. And then the highest priority comes to the national uh, initiatives that commits to certain level of sustainability. So I think it's too early to say that it will be part of the scoring of the tender or not. But I urge the private sector to, to follow and to understand these initiatives as we don't know what will happen when the, by the time we go to the market. But I'm sure that uh, it, it will be some sort of a, of a requirement given that uh, KSA today under the vision has huge commitments when it comes to sustainability and uh, environmental uh, sustainability. Thank you. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the question and I'm, uh, we, we, we've got very, very interesting question. There, there's a lot of question about bankability and, and, and uh, connected with this uh, issue of bankability, a lot of question on traffic. Um, we, we all know that some of the PPP project will be either, uh, I mean, airport uh, dedicated to tourism activities or will be uh, even fully new airport. And this is the question probably for a lot of banks, a lot of investors, a lot of operators to understand how they can secure uh, this traffic. Because when you go and meet with the bank, it's a, it's a big question to tell them, okay, it's a new airport. We have a lot of ambitions. Uh, everybody believe that the, the, uh, the ambitions of, of Saudi Arabia are credible. But at the end of the day, I mean, when you talk to, to banks, when you talk to investors, you need to give them some comfort I mean, do you do you have any plans to give comfort on, on traffic uh, um, in case of a fully new project or, or project dedicated to uh, to uh, plans in, in in developing tourism? So, uh, first of all, we have to understand something, and I'm, sometimes I see some confusion on that. Uh, the, the traffic um, development is, is a purely business development scheme. So you cannot over comfort the private sector where they're not doing any effort to try and attract traffic. That's one. Number two, it also depends on how we regulate. Today, as, as, as GACA, we will set the necessary enablement, bilateral agreements, rights to fly to certain uh, airports. However, if we, if, we, if we look at what, what the government has materialized over its uh, vision programs, it, it really enables traffic. Uh, today and uh, last year, 2022, where it was the, the anchor year in which we had uh, uh, Umrah and tourism through, uh, through the year, we've achieved traffic levels never seen even prior to COVID. So today, when we look at the, mar uh, the market and what it has achieved, we have a certain level of comfort that the traffic uh, risk, if transferred, um, given the study of a certain airport, will not be an issue. Uh, and uh, above and all that, the airports that we are already studying have reached 300% utilization of current capacity. So we have the traffic both, both domestically and internationally. We have a massive uh, Umrah effort coming from the Yuf Rahman program that will try to achieve two to three million monthly Umrah passengers. And we have the massive uh, effort from um, our colleagues at Air Connectivity Program and Ministry of Tourism to try and attract as much traffic as we can. So I believe these programs being materialized in the near future should be sufficient 
the private sector and it should be sufficient to make our airports bankable. However, this brings me back and maybe Abdullah can elaborate more. And this is also why we have the PSP law. The PSP law clearly states that such guarantees must be given when needed, but not necessarily give it to everyone just for the sake of that, that it's bankable. Because if we see the airport bankable with full risk transfer, we're going we're gonna to do that. We have done it previously with airports that are achieving much higher returns. Our airports provide returns and level of traffic guaranteed like you no know, other airports. For example, take Hajj and Umrah. That's basically a guarantee by itself. For you, if you look at Medina, Taif, they have a guarantee because they are a Hajj and Umrah gate. So I don't think there's a lot of pressure on us to uh, to provide such guarantees. We have a thriving economy. We have an ambitious vision that should take care of that. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Abdelaziz, you, you, mashallah, you well, covered it very well uh, and said it very well. Uh, and if, I know I just don't, I'm trying to avoid not to repeat what you just said. And I think I just want to touch on the last sentence that you mentioned. I think today we have, you know, we have an ambition and we want to reach to our targets. We have, we have so much pressure from a government perspective, from senior stakeholders, from His Royal Highness and below and ministers and, so, and their, their excellencies to kind of push and make these kind of investments into the right way. And of course, I don't need to mention this, you know, the kingdom today is growing economy and, and it, it may it aims to double you know, its population in, in, in the coming years. Uh, you know, of course, this is kind of provides indirect assurance to the traffic growth in the aviation sector in general. However, the the, the point on bankability as well, uh, there are two items that, that needs to be looked at. There's one item is that when when there are projects that are by their nature, traffic has, are driven to them and they have that kind of momentum, you know, the bankability will be, will be much, much easier compared to a project where that kind of, you know, uh, traffic is a little bit less. Uh, you know, again, project finance would look always, you, you always look at to the cash flows of, of the of the project and how that impact, uh, you know, you know, the, the debt service ratio, coverage ratio and its implications. And that's what NCP really go and study these kind of things. Perhaps there are differences between the banking kind of case, which is usually a discounted case compared to the government. And this is where NCP comes in and look at a neutral case, where not necessarily it's too aggressive and not necessarily too kind of lenient and too discounted as well and to look to have an interim position and that's where we need to make sure from a structuring perspective as as ncp to structure that in a way that the, you know the banks are comfortable investors are comfortable as well and more importantly is that we provide as i mentioned the guarantees when and if needed you know at ncp you know throughout the six years of its uh, you know establishment We've managed to, you know, to change the company, you know, the the guarantees on PPP projects or long-term projects uh, to a comfort letter. This is a huge success. Has started in in the TBC schools, uh, you know, Tatwir Building Company, you know, and with the Ministry of Education, where where there's no longer requirement of any guarantees from the government, and that's kind of you know goes into other areas as well. There are certain projects from other entities that we are pushing even without that kind of comfort letter, because there are certain stands for that given project that it has its own uh, sufficient uh, sustainability. From that perspective, and even banks, local banks, are happy from the, from that point of view. I understand that international banks will be a little bit reluctant to kind of participate, but I think it's just about evolving with time, where where these transactions, when they're bankable enough in a certain, you know, uh, uh, you know, a certain country, this is where the international bank will feel comfortable to provide these kind of lendings as well. And I think one important point as well, where I have to mention in this as well, is that the the uh, there are other means of supporting the bankability. For example, there is NIF, the National Infrastructure Fund, today where, where there are to establish and to support projects such EVA, such airports and others where it's needed, where it's applicable uh, to perhaps provide its more confidence and its role is not that far from the role of this IDF previously in previous years. I, I, I think, Shaq, I'd like to just... just... Lee? I was just going to build on a, on a point. Um, 
because uh, Abdalila makes um, an extremely pertinent uh, point that I just think this for an in the investor community is worth just reiterating. It's about cash flow um, as much as it is, is it about traffic. Because of course the airport is an ecosystem and generates revenue from, from a multitude of different sources. So it's that, that it's the ability to drive net cash that then gives us the ability to satisfy our financiers and cover obviously any uh, KPIs and standards we have in the repayment of those facilities. And that ultimately is the is the mechanism in which we either understand that the asset has the ability has the ability to become a contributor to share some of that revenue or whether there's a support mechanism needed maybe in the early stages of its life. Um, the other point that I'd, I'd like to make, and I because I believe that there are some very positive moves in this regard, and it's in relation to regulation. Um, these projects, uh, particularly the concessions, are for very long periods of time. So it's, cl it's absolutely clear that we need flexibility. Um, private sector participants uh, you know, recognize that it's not a static market. Um, and these agreements uh, over a long-term period need to have the ability to be able to stimulate demand, need to be able to incentivize air and passenger traffic uh, wherever possible and have open access to those markets that are driving the best demand, um, such as we've talked about, you know, religious tourism. So, uh, you know, but having some, some flexibility within that uh, aeronautical uh, tariff framework, I think will be, be key for project success. I think that I believe this, this is a, a very important point what you're raising. Uh, the the um, the issue of aeronautical fee, you know, it's it's a very important a very important issue. I mean, you can raise the, the fees up to the sky if you want, but at the end of the day, it has an impact on the uh, on the ticket price, and, and, and if it becomes more difficult to fly, if you're uh, targeting on tourism, it may it may become a little bit more difficult for passengers to to fly over to new destinations. So, how do you intend to uh, manage uh, aeronautical fees? Uh, I, I've I've seen that you you have planned that to uh, limit the 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 growth of fees to the level of fees. Maybe uh, um, Abdulaziz, you 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 have some comment well, on this point. Thank you very much for that question. So um, actually, the, the timing of of, of, of this uh, web banner was perfect because two things happened over the last year that showed us what we can do in, in this regard. The first, we took the major airports, we've slashed their their charges, we've set a floor and ceiling, and we told them, guys, you have the flexibility to set your tariff between the floor and ceiling, and we provided them with the enablement to give incentives on new revenues and to attract more traffic. This ended up showing that our airports, uh, that the airlines have responded well. More flights are being flown. If you look, for example, Wizz Air have established more than 14 destinations from Saudi. Uh, Saudi is, is opening new destinations, and it actually was, we've seen the feedback from local international carriers saying that this is, was a good step. One step further is that, okay, we, we need to regulate the aeronautical fees, but not to a level where the private sector has the fear of this, this control being too much, thus uh, affecting their risk or their bankability. So we, we've secured the approval of GAC as board of directors and the, the new regulation should be rolled out soon, where we've given the airports, other than the big three, because the big three are, are some sort of monopolies and we need to always regulate them, but the, the airports, which are some uh, which, and which of them, the, the four that we're planning to tender, is that the operator will have the right to set its own um, uh, tariffs and adjust it as they go throughout the concession with key uh, uh, caveats put in place. The first being that your your uh, whatever you, you you plan to set as a regulatory or aeronautical piece should be competitive and should stimulate traffic. Number two is that they should have necessary mechanisms that will incentivize new traffic, new routes, new airline, increased frequencies. And the third, which is whatever necessary uh, to make sure that you secure a base carrier, you accommodate low cost carriers. So the process now, instead of GAC imposing the tariff as previously done, today the process will be once the project is, is, go, is, is tendered, Part of the submission of the private sector will be their tariff strategy, how they're going to position the airport, what type of traffic they're trying to, an airline they're trying to attract, how are they going to price the airport in the beginning and as they materialize the traffic and as their capacity uh, is achieved. 
And th this is all subject to GAC as approval because we've told ourselves that today we have ambitious privatization mandates. So there's no way that the same regulations with GAC was the regulator or the operator should be applied in the private sector. And it was one of the key lessons learned in our previous PVPs. So I think today we have we have actually reached an amazing level, and I urge everyone to 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 read the new uh, regulation as they get published in the next two weeks or three weeks. It will be hugely comfortable for the private sector to participate in the tender, as it will rely on them to set the charges in a way that stimulates traffic, which brings me back to the traffic allocation question. If I give you autonomy and the availability, the, the ability to, to price your airport in a competitive manner and give proper incentives that will attract traffic, and I give, I sign the needed bilateral agreements for you for you to attract, attract any sort of airline low-cost full, full service, why should I give this traffic guarantee as well? It's just giving more than what the private sector needs. As a result, not incentivizing them to reach certain efficiencies and business development efforts. So I think that because of the main driver, as Abdira said, is to achieve or take advantage of how the private sector can be efficient, can have much better business development uh, efforts, and ensure that we are achieving our mandates, under which is to achieve the 330 million passengers by 2030. Thank you. I mean, I mean, to add to your point, Adriz, as well, which is, I think you've well said it. I think the beauty about airports are, you know, you know, they are they are mainly driven by by the, the the actual developer and the and the investor. There are a lot of ways that they can improve and stimulate revenues from their perspective, and and that's the beauty in that kind of sector. And it's not like others where it's kind of a little bit limited. And that's where the creativity and that's where where it comes in to push for that perspective and, and allow that creativity. And that's one of, by the way, the items that usually, you know, in, in our transactions, especially when, when it's going to come out soon in, in, in the airports, is that what is your tariff strategy? How are you going to achieve? How are you going to stimulate? How are you going to help me in achieving my targets as well? And this is kind of the thing that is, is very crucial that we look into because we need kind of people that are experts that understand this and bring that kind of uh, value add to the government to help them, to help the government to reach its goals as well. Well, well, thank you, thank you, thank you all. I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting question. About the revenue, I have a question concerning another area of the airport business, which is about the commercial activities. And the question is, duty-free shopping and other discretionary retail has traditionally been a major contributor to airport PPPs worldwide. Is this the intention in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia too? Uh, yes, so basically, um, if you look at uh, the first pillar of the first uh, realized goal of the privatization, when, when Riyadh Airport, King Khalid Airport went private in 2016 and it was corporatized and there, there is an increased commercial effort of uh, the, the non-aeronautic revenue went up uh, drastically and, and actually today we're achieving a high spending per passenger level than that we've never seen before together with the laws that the countries already approved today that you can have duty free it's unconstrained and we understand we have developed as a regulator the, uh, a full understanding of how airports can optimize their commercial revenue. Just a good example, look how, how the old airport in, in, in Jeddah was built and the new airport was built. The new airport was built to optimize. There is more than 55,000 square meters of leasable area. Uh, the airport management itself took, took extra necessary steps to try and distribute these areas accordingly. If you look at Riyadh Airport, with all the constraints they're having, they're achieving 35% of non-aeronautical revenue stream. So we understand that this is a crucial part, and we actually have urged the companies that are operating the major airports and the small airports to work on that front. And I believe today we have, we, we, we've added billions in non-aeronautical revenue between 2016 when we started the privatization and today. So a huge element, of, to answer the question, of the tender is, as much as you need to give me your, your aeronautical uh, revenue strategy of how you're going to track traffic, how you're going to accommodate the traffic, which highlights the passenger experience. Because today, part of the passenger experience is to give me that that commercial area that I can dwell with, uh, dwell sorry in, and try to to see that it's developed and it's it's a practice that we see worldwide. Non-aeronautical revenue sometimes are the cash cows of the airport, so why not take advantage of that? 
especially when we have tourism and we have lots of different demographics, different passenger profiles that are passing through our airports. So it will be the operators actually, uh, it will be to their benefit to take advantage of the non-aeronautical revenue and the commercial and expand the commercial areas. And from our side, we're putting all necessary regulations that ease and enable such civilization from the bio, on the private sector. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Abdulaziz. I have still two questions. This is, uh, I'll try, we'll try to answer very quickly. There is one question which is, uh, which concerns the uh, uh, selection criteria. Uh, and the other one, uh, which concerned the uh, the plan for for Jeddah and Riyadh, about the selection criteria, could you disclose a little bit more about uh, the uh, the plan the selection criteria for for the next tender? Uh, uh, for I will I will take this one. Uh, I mean, for the for the selection criteria, there's a very clear, crystal clear, not clear, crystal clear process that NCP go through. It's an EUI process, then an RFQ, then an RFP. The EUI, it will, will there will be, you know, for any project given, but it will be launched without any commitment or with any requirement from the private sector to be participate, you know, for any engagement. It's just a letter saying that we are interested in this project, and here's the red letter. Then following that is the RFQ process. The RFQ process, from our perspective, is very critical because we need to understand that this project today has its own requirements and investments and and, and 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 needs you need to show me as a private sector what is, what are the items and criteria that you have for me to consider you as a final to go to the final you know uh, duration the final uh, uh, state which is the rfp i i as a government would not want to a you know have so many people coming into the rfp state because that will just double the work and double the you know the 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 requirements from my perspective as a government for all given projects of course and more importantly is that from a bit of perspective and perhaps maybe lee will will shed some light into this if he, if he if he you know if he wants is that again when you qualify multiple bidders us multiple bidders 10 12 the the they lose a little bit of interest from the private sector to that kind of given project. The criteria perhaps are, are I maybe I'm not necessarily giving a specific criteria, a specific answer for that point in specific, because it really depends. I, I can assure you today, it, the Abha criteria, selection criteria will not be the same as life because they are two different airports serving two different purposes. And I need different you know, operators, developers to do these different projects. They're not the same. So, uh, you know, for me, we have to kind of look into that. And NCP, with the procurer and the relevant sector, goes into very deep details with legal advisors as well to go and check these requirements and these criteria to be absolutely fair, transparent to everyone. From the day one when people receive the RFQ, they know if they can really do this or not, they can kind of qualify or not. It's absolutely clear. And, and we have sessions. We have every single, you know, RFQ and RFP we launch. By the law, it is a must. It is a must from the government to go and do a conference and listen to the private sector and understand their concerns. And, and, and we walk through, we walk with them through that, their submission and clarification responses and all that. So we won't, it's not like this is the process, either that you have it or, or, and we just leave you. It's not a black box anymore. It's, it, the driven of the peace below is around the transparency. Well, thank you very much, Abdul. I'm, I'm doing a lot on this. On this, on this major comments. I mean, just a quick question before we we we, we terminate is that you have two major airports in in Saudi Arabia. You have Jeddah and you have Riyadh. These airports are close to maximum capacity, and they have major expansion uh, project uh, coming up soon. And the question is that. What are the plans for, for this airport? Do you plan to put them as a PPP project uh, soon? And uh, in the view of um, financing this expansion project, or do we have other views? So, uh, at, the, uh, um, at, at the current stage, 
the approach taken for these two airports is to corporatize them, which is because at the end, PVP is a sort of privatization, but there's other solutions. However, on, 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 on the, the, the layers below the airport as, as a whole, we are always encouraging as the, as the strategy custodian to involve the private sector participation, not necessarily as a PVP, because these two airports are, are, are national airports, we, we have major expansion plans that we don't want to burden the private sector with, because the private sector, after all, has, has a certain threshold. And the, for example, Riyadh today will, will cost hundreds of billions, the expansion, because we want, to, we want to have an iconic design, we want to have it as a global hub. So these, actually, when we looked at, at how we're going to approach these airports, these, these airports are, 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 are hubs and are, are achieving, let's say, 60% of the 330 million. So to avoid the burden and to make sure that we achieve our goals, we decided to corporatize them. They're actually doing very well today. We have Jetco managing Jeddah. We have Iraq managing Riyadh airports. They're fully commercialized airports. However, what we've seen, the trend that is happening in, in the last four to five years is that they're willing to do PVPs as part of the certain activities. The other airport today is doing a PVP for, the, for its fuel farm, where it's tendering it as a BOT. We've seen in Jeddah that they are working the Hajj terminal, for example, that it will be at the terminal itself as a PVP. So for these airports, there will be no PVP on the airport as a whole. But we encourage the private sector to go to these companies and understand them how what is their commercial strategies and try to be involved in, and let's say, let's call them concessions, duty-free. Because Jinta, for example, is, is tendering the duty-free right now. But at the end, uh, as you said, there's a huge expansion plan. We're expecting these airports to go, go above 100 million. So it, it, it will be a bit challenging to go as a PPP because we might not see eye to eye with the private sector on the level of uh, of um, uh, uh, of traffic we need to do. And we've seen as a best practice that in order to have the proper hub, there's a synergy between the airline, the hub airline and the airport. And we believe it will be challenging to achieve under a PVP, which is why we decided to go with, to go with this approach. We're very, we're very comfortable with this approach because these airports even 10 years ago were already profitable and making money that and all what it needs is certain efficiencies that can be achieved through capitalization and to ensure that we achieve our strategies for them. Thank you for, I think I took a Thank bit you. more time, but I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, um, Abdulaziz. Well, I mean, we are reaching the end of this webinar and I'm impressed by the number of professionals who have joined this uh, uh, new web webinar. And, and, and I want to thank you also all the uh, the, the speakers for, for their, their nice, um, uh, talk during this uh, webinar. So uh, just to tell everybody, this uh, video will be recorded and available on the YouTube and LinkedIn uh, channel of WAP. And there will be probably in the coming weeks some uh, information uh, synthesizing or discussion. And it will be published in the, the, the web times. I would like also to take the opportunity to inform everyone uh, that in the region, there will be a WAP PPP international event uh, which will be held physically on the 17, 18, and 19 of October in Abu Dhabi under the umbrella of the World Investment Forum. And I think some of you will be uh, already attending the, the event. So thank you all, and thank you for, for this webinar. Thank you all. Bye. Thank, thank you. you all so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all.